We warmly greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to our online worship service here at Eastbridge Presbyterian Church. If you're listening for the first time, we've been doing a series of messages on the topic of the means of grace or the disciplines of grace, the things that God has ordained in His Word and uses by His Spirit to bring real change uh, into the lives of His people, changing us more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. Today, we come to that great means of grace, communion, or the Lord's Supper. We have entitled this, The Means of Grace, Covenant Participation. And we're looking at that classic passage on the subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, hear now God's most holy word. For I, that is the Apostle Paul, received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes." A survey was taken uh, back in uh, 2003 that asked Americans this question, what are the words you most want to hear from someone of importance to you? And the answers that were most frequently given, the top three, were these, I love you, I forgive you, and come to supper. Well, in the sacrament of communion, God says all three things that we most long to hear. I love you, I forgive you, and come to supper. These are the three things that God wants us most to know because He yearns that we know all the way down to our toenails, to the deepest fiber of our being, that He loves us with His steadfast and everlasting and unchangeable love. The Apostle John pictures at that first Lord's Supper that he was in touch with this passion in his Lord that sympathized with and harmoniously vibrated within himself that yearning for intimate communion and connection with his Lord as he leaned on Jesus' bosom, John 13 tells us, at the supper. Jesus himself is recorded as saying in Luke's gospel, verses 15 and 16, at this great covenant meal, he said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I'll not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. We have a deep craving within us that was made to harmoniously sympathize with a craving inside God Himself, and that is for us to be able to see God, to touch Him, to be nearer to Him than our very breath. And so this sacrament, this means of grace, is supplied by God to address that longing, to touch, to see, to smell, to taste. All of the senses are involved in this multi-sensory enjoyment of God's love. We see, first of all, in looking at this passage, that this is a covenant feast. 
you will notice Jesus' words there in verse 25. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, linking what he's doing here back to the prophecy of Ezekiel that described that new covenant that God was going to make where he would write his word upon the very tablets of our hearts. Hebrew religion moved through an annual rhythm of uh, merrymaking, of festivals, of uh, joyful celebration. Uh, Hebrew religion was marked often by a note of delirious, exhilarating merriment. They were known to be people who, in music and dance, expressed an intensity of passion, all of which centered around their worship of God. Yes, there was solemnity, certainly as well. But this was the buoyant element. So that even with the fasting, it was never about the fasting. That was not the high point. The high point was the feasting that followed the fasting. Jesus, you may remember, was criticized in that both he and his disciples did not fast. And he said, when the bridegroom is present with you, You don't fast, you celebrate. And we are invited through this sacrament sacrament, to a dinner party with God. Therefore, it's marked by this element of joy and of peace and security and intimacy and family fellowship, warmth, closeness, tenderness, a kind of face-to-face sense of belonging and unrushed enjoyment of one another. All of these things were wrapped up into the Near Eastern concept of a feast or a banquet. And this communion feast is actually just an appetizer course to a greater feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb that is described in Revelation 19. Eastern meals, you may know if you've studied anything about Near Eastern culture, were lavish affairs. They ate not hastily, but they lingered at the table, enjoying and savoring the various dishes because the main point was not the consumption, it was the camaraderie. It was the fellowship. It was the communication, the enjoyment of one another at the feast that took place around the meal. So the feast is about gladness, not gloom. It's about delight, not despair. It's about splendor, not sadness. You know, as I think about this, hunger embedded within each of us, I can see how COVID has co-opted our community in a lot of ways. And it is why all of us are experiencing a, a passionate longing for this kind of meal fellowship to be, to be, for us to be able to enjoy that with each other again. The deprivation of that intensifies our longing for it. But the menu at this particular feast, the Lord's Supper, has a sobering element to it as well. It all happened, you see, our passage tells us at the end of verse 23, in the night in which he was betrayed. So the context, the event of betrayal, was matched by the content of what was about to happen. The supper was a prelude. It was a vivid kind of sneak preview, what was shortly coming in just a few hours away. But yes, we must see he was not only betrayed by a man by the name of Judas, but that man's unique sin and all of its ugly scandal exposes the betrayal that is embedded in all of our sinfulness. So the bread 
was his body broken. The wine was his blood poured out. There's a clear and obvious connection here to the precursor to this new covenant meal, which was the old covenant meal of Passover. It occurred, the inauguration of the new covenant meal, in the very setting of the celebration of a Passover meal. The connection is obvious. You remember that in that Passover meal, there was a lamb for each household that was slain, and its blood was taken and smeared on the doorpost and on the lintel so that the death angel as it passed over Egypt would pass over and not, to dis- not destroy any, not judge any in the household where the blood was smeared on the door and lentil. So the death that the worshiper deserved is averted by justice, judgment, falling on the substitute, the lamb. The graphic symbolism here is that just as we are kept alive physically by eating food, the worshiper is kept alive spiritually by the life that is supplied through the death of the victim, the sacrificial victim, the substitute. All of this is pointing to the fact that the feast is a covenant feast. But it's a covenant feast that provides covenant fellowship. If you flip back just one chapter to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let your eyes fall upon verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The word repeated there a couple of different times, participation in the English Standard Version, is the exact same word, koinonia, that is translated many other places, fellowship or communion. It is a term that is dripping with relational intensity and richness. It involves a kind of mutuality, of sharing, of togetherness, uh, which obviously is a picture of the reversal of the consequences of sin that entered in the fall in the book of Genesis. There you remember that the result of the sin of the man and the woman was separation, distance from one another, from God, first of all. That's why they were hiding from God, seeking to conceal their shame, their nakedness. They were sensing the cleavage between them and God. The union they had joined, had had enjoyed, had been fractured. But not only were they separated from God in that vertical relationship, but in the horizontal relationship with one another, and separated even within themselves in the kind of psychic fissures, the breaking apart, all of the brokenness that is involved as a consequence of sin, separated even from the environment, that which, with which they cooperated harmoniously. Suddenly, the soil renders weeds and thorns and thistles, and, 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 he, and the man has to labor by the sweat of his brow. And so there is this kind of fissure or separation involved. But with communion, it's, it's the reversal, the, ro- the rolling back of the implications of the fall. The word communion is two words, com plus union. In other words, It's union with. The word calm means with, union with. So it's the idea of a union that is enjoyed, that is experienced, that's relished, 
that's tasted, and thus the idea of the meal. Communion involves a reuniting of those things which when separated brought death. And so with the reuniting of these things, there's a recovery of life, which means that to be united to Christ implies that the only life I now have is Christ's life. When He died, I died. When He rose, I rose. When He was judged on Calvary and shrieked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was my judgment, endured, experienced, and dispatched when he cried, it is finished, meaning that the judgment was over. The sentence had been served. So my death has already occurred. My resurrection has already occurred. And the implications of this are brought out in Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, when he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. You died when Christ died. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. Notice the element of certitude there. So, the life that God measures you and me by, if we trust in Him, is the life of Christ. He sees you. He measures you. He calculates who you are and what you are by Christ, not by yourself. He views us, therefore, and receives us and estimates our impact and monitors His delight in us just as if we actually are Christ. So communion is God's holy drama where this reality is experienced by us and enjoyed among us. In this sacrament, God actually comes to us in a way that is unique. Now, we know that God is omnipresent. And we know that He is always with us. His promise, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And yet, it is also true that there are special settings special moments, special environments where the, what the old Puritans called God's manifest presence, His enjoyed presence, breaks through with a unique and pristine reality. Communion is the place where more than any other place or any other time in this life, this side of heaven, we actually experience a foretaste of heaven itself. It's the closest thing that we can actually be to heaven while still being on the earth. The words on the sacred page become physical matter that is beheld, physical matter that is tasted, physical matter that is ingested and assimilated and absorbed and spreads into every fiber of our being. We have a saying concerning our physical bodies that we are what we eat. There's a new version of this among nutritionist folk. Let your food be your medicine. Uh, similar idea. So, uh, wh when we eat and when we drink over a period of time, we become uh, sort of the composite of the last X number of meals physically. Well, spiritually, when we eat and drink, 
which, by the way, is a metaphor for believing. Active, conscious, situational, existential trust in the person and work of Christ. When we eat and drink, that which these emblems display enters us so that we become a composite, if you will, of the last X number of spiritual meals. And if our meal is Christ, His body broken, His blood shed. That's how this is a means of grace, a means of change. Through this, as we enjoy Christ, we are changed. You've heard me describe it before in this way. We enjoy our way into change. And here we classically see that in this unique and special means of grace, communion. So, when the sacrament is received by faith, something is genuinely imparted. It's more than simply a bare memorial. Grace is imparted. And it's imparted in such a way that our brokenness, our neediness, is transformed into that which actually binds us to Him. Our claim to fame spiritually is that we need a mender. We need to be mended. We need a brokenness fixer. And that, of course, is His specialty. Years ago, back when my mother was still alive and ministering in Ukraine to little orphan children there, we had a neighbor who knew about my mother and was asking about her one day. And I was sort of bringing him up to date, and he uh, said to me, well, there must be a very special place in heaven for her. <laughs> what a golden gospel opportunity that was. I responded uh, something like the following, well, let me just tell you this, the thing that she's looking forward to more than anything else is, is being in a place where she doesn't deserve it at all, but she has it unchangeably, forever, as a gift, an undeserved gift. That's the meaning of the word grace, of course. So what is our contribution to this partnership, this covenant of fellowship or covenant of partnership? What do we bring to the table? We bring our sin. He brings our salvation. We bring our guilt. He brings our pardon. We bring our defilement. He brings our purity. We bring our shame, and He brings our royal status as sons and daughters of the high King of heaven. We bring our weakness, and He brings strength. So, we see that this is a covenant feast, a covenant fellowship that involves a covenant forth-telling. Notice verse 26, Paul says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim something. You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. You see, in this sacrament, we become part of, of God's show and tell act. The realities that are conveyed to us in the gospel are conveyed by us and conveyed through us to others. We become God's living, walking, talking, breathing gospel video. We participate in the drama. Here's the part, the bit part we have in the drama. We do the eating and the drinking, which means that we do the acceptance and we do the enjoyment. But He provides all the rest. He provides the feast. He spreads the table. We put our feet up under His table. It's the Lord's table. We bring nothing but our hunger and our thirst. So we say with the apostle, in Him I live and I move and I have my being. He's the foundation of my hope. He's the sunshine of all my days. He's the object of my highest joys. Everything in my little bit part, is about Him. Self dies glorious death so that He might rise within me and through me. So the central theme 
of our proclamation, the apostle says, is his death, the cross. So in the gospel, it's not first and foremost about ethics. It's not about uh, turning over a new leaf or turning our life around. It's not about some great moral example or great moral teacher. It's not primarily about a religious social reform movement. It is this, that Christ died for sinners. And therefore the witnesses, the proclaimers, are forgiven sinners, not puffed up self-satisfied moralists. So if you feel the religious equivalent of smug self-satisfaction, this meal is not for you. But if you're broken, needy, destitute, ruined, hopeless, and helpless, except for Christ, this meal is for you. And you have a meal ticket if your trust is holy and only in Him. So Christian, <laughs> this is our pulpit. Toward God, we declare our trust and the renewal of our allegiance and love to Him. Toward ourselves, we reaffirm our confidence and our assurance that we are His. And toward others, we announce this saving word. We re-experience the height, depth, and breadth of the love of God, a love that passes knowledge. <laughs> That's why God gave this thing to us in a way that includes our rationality but is supra-rational, includes all of our senses, smell, hearing, taste, touch, as I described earlier. And yet all of that kind of multisensory enjoyment is designed to elevate our gaze to that truth that so easily eludes us that we are loved with an everlasting love. So it's a covenant feast, a covenant fellowship that results in a covenant forthtelling but it also involves, lastly, a covenant forecasting. I want you to notice that phrase at the end of verse 26. Till He comes. We proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So it's not just a remembrance looking backwards. It is a pro-membrance looking forward. Looking forward to the consummation and the perfection of all things when Christ returns. That's why we said near the beginning that this is an appetizer course, if you will, and, and an anticipatory meal that causes us to look forward to an even greater, richer, fuller enjoyment of these things at that marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's more than a a farewell meal that Jesus is having with his disciples on that evening before the cross. But it was also a forecasting meal. It was an anticipatory banquet, like a rehearsal supper for a wedding. Matthew 26, 29, I tell you, I will not eat of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. As much as their hearts were saddened by his revelation that he was soon to depart from them, he hangs before them <laughs> the great gospel carrot of hope. It's not going to end there. There will come a day when he will drink anew with us in his Father's kingdom. He's claiming final victory here, and that, that final victory is as certain as the fact of his seeming defeat at the cross. You remember World War II, there was D-Day. And historians looking back tell us that D-Day made V-Day, Victory Day, certain. Well, there was a lot of warfare left after D-Day, before V-Day. But it was in large measure a mop-up campaign. Similarly, the D-Day of the death of Christ makes certain 
the V-Day of the marriage supper of the Lamb. His coming as the God-man, paying the dowry price to purchase us as his bride, anticipates and assures and guarantees his glorious coming again to receive his bride to himself. This has been the great theme of the ages, from Genesis to Revelation. The promise of the purchase as his bride that would inexorably lead to his possession of us as we would see him and know him face to face forever. At this table, we reestablish our spiritual bearings. We see the goal, the meaning of our lives in terms of this eternal destiny. Here, therefore, everything else in our lives, our trials, our pain, our sorrows, our tragedies, and our disappointments pale into insignificance against this glorious backdrop. Oh, Christians, enjoy now where you're headed. It is true that if we do not have this consolation, there is no other consolation that will matter. If we do not receive and enjoy this change agent, nothing else can bring change into our hearts and lives that is more than mere external cosmetic adjustments. This is why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Communion is it's like a spiritual time warp that collapses the cross and the second coming of Christ into one great spiritual cosmic moment that makes the past provision and the promised paradise our present portion. Hallelujah. Let's pray. We behold you, O man of sorrows, betrayed by our sin, bearing the wrath we deserve, beaten, mocked, scorned, thorn-crowned. Thus your redeeming love was poured out in purging our sin, providing our righteousness, and procuring us as your eternal possession, your bride forever. We, we, the very ones who nailed you to that tree, are not only pardoned, but provided a place at your table to dine with you in sweet fellowship now and forever. Hallelujah. God be praised. Amen.